Good day, everybody. Hello. All right. Um, I want to start just by thanking some people who've helped make today possible. So thank you very much to, and I'll, I'll put you all together so we can give you one extra big round of applause. Uh, Travis helped with production today at the front table and with a great intro. Vic from VSM Photo is helping run the cameras for today. And then we've got Skyla and Winnie who worked also at the registration table, as well as the Hilton for helping us out. So let's give them all a round of applause for making today happen. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Awesome. So I, um, I just got back from a little trip to San Francisco and then Austin and then Vancouver and came back here and had a lot of time to do some uh, great networking and great thinking. And one of the products of that is a handout that you're going to get today called the Engine Room. The Engine Room is going to be um, really our guide for the whole day. And what you're going to get out of learning about the Engine Room is a real kind of step-by-step um, -step of sorts of how you can build a team around you that really dramatically accelerates your success. Um, not only that, your team can help you to actually have to work fewer hours in a given day, week, month, quarter, year. And frankly, when you've got a great team, it also just makes the journey a heck of a lot more funner. So, with no further ado, let's get those handed out. Um, Skyla, do you have the engine room handouts? Wait, no? Okay, okay, sounds great. Oh, they're right here? Okay, thank you. Okay, awesome. Oh, Travis, oh, oh Winnie, you got upstaged. <laughs> yes. Okay. So while those are being passed out, I'll share with you guys just a little bit about, um, about this, this trip to Austin. Um, I was invited to go to a wedding for a couple friends of mine who are book promoters. And believe it or not, they've put the last 82 consecutive books that they've promoted onto the New York Times, USA Today, Wall Street Journal bestseller lists. So we're talking like the world's best book promoters. They're <laughs> The, the people in the room, I felt like blown away. We're talking world celebrities in a handful of different markets, including people from Indonesia and New Zealand, Australia. There's between two and 300 people there, and it was hosted at this place called the Wizard Academy. The Wizard Academy is I 50 acres, 100 acres, this huge, sprawling Texas property that literally has like a, a castle tower on it where lectures happen and uh, you know um, dinners and whatnot. Then there's another building that's literally an Italian chapel called Chapel Dulcinea that overlooks this, this valley. Breathtaking, absolutely breathtaking. And it really, at one point, I just kind of, as I was mixing and mingling with all of these very as, as accomplished people, I just kind of thought to myself, what would I be doing right now if I didn't take the team approach to building my business. I, I couldn't be in this situation right now. And I also went back in my mind to all the points where I had reservations about bringing people on. All of a sudden, things like, should I really give my assistant my credit card or not? All of a sudden become far smaller considerations. All of a sudden, questions like, well, how do I know if this assistant is going to work? Or how do I know if um, you know, I'm not going to get screwed over by somebody that I give them my username and password? Those are all objections that I had along the way. I see some people smiling and they're like, yep, that's me. And a lot of that comes into perspective when you start looking at the full picture, right? The opportunity cost. What do you give up by not building a team around you? Because it's not just the cost of say, the small risks or maybe some of the big risks we might take, but it's also what is the opportunity cost that you're giving up by not building a team around you, okay? Um, along the way, I mean, I'm in this, at this wedding with all these people who are experts and authors and, you know, world-renowned storytellers, 
And more than once, I got asked, Tim, you know, what is your story? Tim, why do you do what you do? And I felt a little bit naked and vulnerable because I know that they're going to get their answer one way or the other. <laughs> and what kind of came out a few times, just m with greater and greater clarity every time I repeated it, was I really think that entrepreneurs are the hub of a wagon wheel. So think of an old Wild West kind of wagon wheel on a carriage. And there's all these spokes that all come into that middle center hub. And I think that entrepreneurs really punch above their weight class when it comes to producing value and good and um, just contributing to everybody around them. That includes clients, that includes vendors, that includes maybe investors, it includes their family, it includes such a huge group of people. And so it's very sad for me if a business goes down because that center hub falls out and all the spokes fall with it. What's even sadder for me is that flame that resides inside of every single entrepreneur that got us to take that leap of faith at some point, to quit our day jobs and to open a business. That flame to me is actually even more cherished and more special than the whole wagon wheel. Because a business can go down, but as long as that flame continues to exist inside the entrepreneur, that entrepreneur could go on to the next business, the next business, the next business, as the case may be. So the idea that a business might go down needlessly because they just didn't have the right tools, like the engine room that I'm sharing with you today, like systems that I've shared with you before, maybe a few marketing ideas along the way, to know that it maybe could have been avoided with just a few simple tools, to me, I think that's really what Profit Factory is about is giving you, like, you, I think you can all agree I'm not a rocket scientist. <laughs> what I teach is not rocket science. Sometimes we just need somebody to kind of paint the picture for us. Somebody to kind of bring your awareness around something. Maybe take a few ideas you didn't realize were related and stick them together and say this is how this all fits together. And that's really what I'm here to do, is to help you see the tools, some of the mindsets, and how you can combine them all together so that you can avoid an unnecessary maybe struggle and also to maybe reach new levels that you were not on course for until you learn those few tools. So looking at the engine room, I want you to consider this. So um, this is not on your printout, okay? But I'm, you know, can everybody see this? Maybe put your hand up if you can see it. Yeah? The back, Paul, yeah? Okay. So what you see right here this is, this is growth stage one, okay? And what you see here is just a black circle with the letter E in the middle, okay? That's for entrepreneur, okay? I told you guys, I'm not a rocket scientist, <laughs> okay? And in the very beginning of our businesses, we are the entire engine room, okay? We are, you know, taking the orders, processing the orders, fulfilling the product, doing customer service after it, asking for testimonials. We're doing everything ourselves. We are the entirety of the business. We are the engine room in of ourselves, okay? Who identifies with that stage right now? Okay, so we've got like about three quarters of the room, okay? Then something's gonna happen where along the way, you're gonna have to make a choice where you're gonna have to choose to either introduce some team members or else fire some clients and maybe just get more refined. And there's nothing wrong with saying, okay, I've got 10 clients, I'm maxed out, I'm gonna ax the bottom two. You know, as long as you and them are in good standing and you've met your agreements and all the ethical questions, then that is one way to reduce your workload. And just always knowing that you're always seeking to just refine that, those eight clients along the way. And that would be a way to do it without ever having to increase the team or increase the complexity of your business, okay? The road that I took, and many of you are probably thinking of, is kind of a stage two situation here. And now we're starting to look actually like molecules in science, but um, what you see right here is the same black circle in the middle with an E, okay? And on the outside, there's three white circles, okay? So to me, that represents the virtual assistants or contractors that you might help or that you might hire, I'm sorry, along the way to help you. Now, I went through this, and um, a number of uh, entrepreneurs that I know have also gone through this. 
the upside of this is now you don't have to do all the tasks. However, um, look where all roads lead to, right? All roads lead to you, still the entrepreneur. And that's OK, because for a little while, you'll want to do that as you're kind of figuring out how to be the leader that you need to be and what tools you need in place to have a smooth flowing team, OK? So, so far, uh, who identifies with this stage right now? One, two, three, four. OK, so probably almost the last quarter of the room. So let me paint a very exciting picture for you. This is what awaits you at the next step, OK? The next step, maybe someday I'll give these cool names. Currently, this is just stage three, OK, is this. This is what it looks like when you have an engine room working for you. Now, the really important question that I think bears asking is, where is the entrepreneur, the black circle with the letter E, where is the entrepreneur in this diagram of the engine room? The <laughs> 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 I can count on Shannon for this answer. On the beach. <laughs> yeah, right there. Yeah, there, yeah. Except there's a problem with this picture. He's still on a laptop. He's still working, right? <laughs> Ash, Ash said Austin, Texas, being, be, being Harry Potter, right? Yeah, at the Wizard Academy. Yeah. I've actually been told I look like Daniel Radcliffe, so who knows? Maybe, maybe that's got more truth than I realize. And so when you've got an engine room set up for you, You've got, you have an entire team that is working. They're producing whatever it is that you produce, whether it's a product or a service. And I have to tell you that this is terrifying for me in new ways that I would have never imagined. Okay? When I, ha with an engine room in place, it hit me the other day, oh my goodness, there is now a force running that is bigger than me. Like, I, I cannot, I, two things. One, if this went down, like, and ended, they all just said, Tim, you know, thanks, but no thanks, I would be royally screwed. <laughs> I could not possibly pick up all the balls that are in the air and keep them moving. And let me tell you, that's a little bit scary for me. As entrepreneurs, at some point, maybe you're in this right now, you have to be the entire engine room. Literally, the strategy not only for success but for survival is for you to juggle all the balls and to be at the very center of the entire production team. Right? Like, if this is you, everything runs through you. And at some level, you can continue operating this way until you just can't keep up with these three anymore. So by definition, by definition, you have to go to a place where it's now bigger than you. Now, there's some very cool things that happen when your engine room team is bigger than you. Like, for example, you wake up and things got done over the last day and you had nothing to do with it, you know? Or let's say you had everything to do with the start of it and setting it up, and then you didn't touch it, OK? Um, and as your engine room works together longer and longer, they get better and better. And now they start doing something very scary when they're smarter than you. And they're better than you at the very tasks that maybe you trained them on just a few months earlier. That is an extra scary point because now you don't have the energy and time, the bandwidth to pick up the balls if they fall, but you also don't have the skills to do it the way that they do it. And that is a place of kind of scary vulnerability or something, okay? So you better be nice to your people. <laughs> so. A very quick example, um, you guys saw Skyla on the way in, um, and, and Winnie was also helping at the front as well. 
And those of you that were here last month at, uh, at our Profit Factory Leaders Luncheon last month, um, you probably had a rocky experience coming through the check-in process. Like, my understanding is some people tried to pay and then it didn't work, so then they went to the Hilton to pay at the Hilton front desk, and, but the Hilton had been told they're not touching payment anymore to send people back. So people got bounced back, and then people still weren't, just total, total mess, okay? And there's a few ways to handle that situation, right? Before I talk about that, I'll just say, today, was the check-in process better? I'm curious. Was it a smooth process today? Yes? Okay. Did everybody get checked in in under five minutes? Did anybody not get checked in in under five minutes? Okay, so 100% of people. Okay. That is something we're gonna talk about in a moment called definition of done. So don't feel that you need to write that down, but I will explain that in a moment. And so I said to the team after the last event, I said, guys, I talked to everybody in the room or as many as were willing to talk to me and it was a train wreck and that's not a judgment on your skill or character it's just what happened <laughs> so definition of done for the next lunch is whatever we got to do we want you know as an attendee to the event we need to make sure everybody gets processed in five minutes or less okay as the front desk team I you know the front desk team needs to be able to process everybody smoothly and not have to deal with frustrated people. <laughs> Me as the speaker, I need to be able to show up and speak and not have to deal with administrative concerns, right? So it's like we put all these different, what are called actually user stories in place and said, how are we gonna figure that out? And so I felt this momentum of the engine room in such clear, you know, technicolor vibrancy just, I would say, two days ago, when Sarah, my main assistant, who is located in Indiana and yet was very important as part of the team to bring this together, she said, oh, Tim, um, in the mail, like, please, you know, I've put into your calendar to stop by your mailbox because in the mail, it's arrived now, is your square reader, and I need you to bring that back, tie it to your bank account, Skyla's already got the app on her phone, ready to process payments. All she needs is just the little square once you've got the bank account set up and it's done. And in my mind, I thought, wow, the solution has been found, plus Sarah is like three steps ahead of me, and she's talked to the front desk person and has told me, in the 100% of steps, you just need to worry about these five. So just go do those critical few, and the rest is taken care of. And I sat there just like, whoa. <laughs> that is damn cool, right? Okay, um, so I, I said, you know, h handling, handling mistakes or challenges. So that's the first item. The second item, um, so I was in Vancouver a few days ago. I'm a part of Strategic Coach. Some of you have heard of Strategic Coach before. Four times in 2015, I'm in Vancouver for each installment. It's kind of a quarterly get-together of entrepreneurs. And, um, and Sarah and I had some growing pains, actually through Austin and Vancouver, where um, I ended up at an Airbnb place in Austin. I got there, it was kind of so-so. I was looking for a towel, they didn't have one. I texted the hosts, they didn't get back to me. Then it was like later at night, it was like two in the morning, I wanted to go to bed. I opened up the bed, there was actually like hairs from the previous guest. So I decided to leave at like 2.30 in the morning and I got into a, you know, an, an Uber vehicle and went and found a hotel. Now, downtown Austin is like two to 300 bucks a night and I didn't want to spend that. So I thought if I go just a little bit of downtown, different hotel, should be fine. I check into this place, it's in the price range, it looks all right, and I then am greeted by a guy who's got neck tattoos, you know, at the front desk. <laughs> Not a big deal in of itself. There's a it was strange picture of a man who looks kind of like a mafia like godfather on the wall. There's this like interesting smell of incense or something burning. And there's for the size of building, there's oddly few guests in it. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, like I think I'm in a money money laundering like hotel run by the mob. <laughs> 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 
I'll get through for the next two, three days, and um, it'll be a good story. So it's while I was in the hotel room in Austin, the mob hotel, that I actually drew out the engine room. And what was really magical about it is all I had to do was sketch it out on a piece of paper. And then after that, sort of my ideas, I did put a very rough sketch into like Mac pages, not Adobe Photoshop or some kind of professional software. And then I just fired it off to Travis, and Travis did the rest of the work to carry it the next 70% along the way. So whether you're producing marketing materials or you've got your system doing scheduling, like this is the power of the engine room. So Sarah and I had a few of these hiccups where the Airbnb place was not so hot. Um, you know, then uh, the following day I went to lunch uh, with somebody in Austin that wanted to meet with me. And I arrived at the right restaurant but the wrong location. <laughs> right. Um, I also had another dinner with somebody else that wanted to meet with me. And I think the menu, like it was someone who was just more of a kind of a casual acquaintance. The, the menu started entrees at like 85 or 100 bucks a plate. And for a first get together for someone who really I didn't think was a prospect or anything, for me it was a little bit rich for my blood, at least at this point in my life. So that was a little bit of like, ooh, okay, maybe you know, on opentable.com when we're booking these things, we could look at the little number of dollar signs or something, right? Um, then in Vancouver, um, she, you know, I showed up at Strategic Coach, but it turned out that Strategic Coach had made an exception, and for this one meeting, it was actually at a different hotel. And so it, it took me half an hour to walk to you know, the next place, and I ended up being late, and all the rest. So just yesterday, somebody said to me, Tim, you know, why, why did you handle that the way that you did? Like, you could have said, oh, well, you know, Sarah, you've made a couple of scheduling mistakes. You know, I need to take care of this because, you know, you don't seem to be able to do it, you know? Or, um, get really upset, you know, and, 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 and kind of come down on her. I mean, first of all, anybody who's dealt with Sarah, she's amazing. You know what I mean? She's phenomenal. So let's just put that on the table. And normally, she's just like super A plus, triple A, everything is T's are crossed, I's are dotted, phenomenal. So why would you give away a person like that, right? Love her to bits. Love her to bits. And in, when somebody's asked me, you know, Tim, why were you okay with being 30 minutes late for this event, you know, the strategic coach that you paid thousands of dollars to be a part of and you've flown you know, to another province for? I said, you know what? It's more important to me that I get to stay in the right spot in the engine room, right? It's more important to me that I stay here, outside of the engine room, than it is for me to be 30 minutes early or grabbing control of this task again, because it would just be going backwards, okay? So let's talk about the engine room. Let's talk about the engine room and how you can build yours. So you'll see that there's, there's probably some words on here that look familiar that you've seen if you've come to previous talks. You know, we've got words like Scrum and Systems and Colby and, um, in a lot of ways, this is aggregating a lot of the lessons that we've covered in past talks. If you've come to the weekend course, we've gone really deep into some of these, okay? And I think maybe the most important statement on this entire piece of paper is just below the title where it says the engine room. Engine room. It says, name of the game. Pick the players, set the rules, explain how to win, get the hell out of the way. And I mean it get the hell out of the way, okay? Because as long as you're on the field, how can you possibly grow the business the way that you could, okay? So it really comes down to, it's very simple. In the very center is the engine room, okay? And below engine room, it says the, that the engine room produces towards the goal, whatever the goal is, okay? So far, so good. Where I encourage you to think about starting in building your engine room, and some of you have, al have already done some of this or maybe a lot of this, is to kind of get a sense of like, what are we trying to accomplish? What are the tasks and projects that I'm working on, okay? For those of you that have been to the weekend course where I teach a lot about Scrum, it's, that's what's called your product backlog. So you just, you know, basically unload, hey, we want to do this marketing campaign. Hey, we want to maybe, 
you know, start processing credit cards, or hey, you know, I really want to attend this conference, or just whatever it is that you think needs to get done to move the business forward. You put it all on the wall in what's called your product backlog. Okay? That's scrum terminology. If it sounds a little funny, it's, it's software developers that come up with these words. So product backlog. And once you've got a sense of like, hey, this is what I want to get done, this is what I want the engine room to help me produce, then after that, you're going to go ahead and start at the top here, where it says assemble and arrange team. Okay? There are three parts to the mind. We discussed this last month. Okay? There's the cognitive, the affective, and the conative. The cognitive is going to be the skills that you need on the team. So if it's a graphic designer, they better be able to run Adobe Photoshop or InDesign. They better understand how colors work together, what fonts look good, serif, non-serif, all of this. Okay? And here's the thing, is if you're hiring a graphic designer to take the graphic design work off your plate, are you going to hire someone who's worse than you or better than you at graphic design? Better. Probably better, okay? If you're going to hire somebody to manage your schedule or your email inbox, are you going to hire someone who's better or worse than you? Better. Probably better, or else you're going to be the one that all the, when things fall through the cracks and someone's got to pick up you know, the mistakes that have been made, you'll be the one picking them up and now you're no further ahead, okay? So you can start seeing as you start assembling this team around you when they all are, you know, in each of their domains, they are better than you at that domain, suddenly you have this team that kicks your ass because <laughs> they're just better than you, okay? So that's cognitive. So we might say that's like what you can do or what this person you're considering hiring can do. In the middle is affective, that's wanting to do, okay? So that's when you're interviewing someone, you want to know what are your goals, right? Do you plan to be with me for three years? You know, are you willing to work at least 10, 15, 20, or 40 hours a week? Um, are you okay with a virtual setup or an in-house setup if you're going to co-locate co your entire team? Um, anytime you talk about a personality test like Myers-Briggs or DISC, that's affective, okay? Plus, do you like the person? Right? Do you think you can even get along with them? Right? Interviewing is pretty powerful for that kind of stuff. The third area is conative. So it's not what a person can do. It's not what they would like to do. It's what they will do. It's their working instinct. If you give them a problem to solve, are they going to go and do a bunch of research first? Or are they going to throw a bunch of spaghetti on the wall and see what sticks? Are they going to ask for a 90-day plan? You would be amazed, because I do a lot of Colby assessments behind the scenes with clients, um, I'm actually, and for Ryan Levesque, um, the client that Travis mentioned during the intro, uh, where I helped him set, set him up to go from seven to eight figures, and he's in that process right now. Um, I'm probably going to do a big 25-person Colby, you know, analysis and assessment all at once. So that'll be an exciting project to undertake. Um, when you've got two people in the same room that are very different in their Colby scores in certain modes, it really it can be challenging, right? A difference, for those of you that know about Colby and have your score, a difference of four or more in any one mode has the potential to create what's called conative conflict. So for example, I'm a high fact finder, right? And so that's a seven. If I'm in a one-on-one -on -one meeting with someone who's like a three in fact finder or a two or a one, that means I really like to get a lot of information before I make a decision and I also like to share a lot of information when I'm explaining something, just like I'm doing right now. And that low fact finder is going to just want the bottom line. Like, okay, enough details, just give me, like, what's the executive summary on top of your 20-page report? And you can imagine in that kind of a meeting situation, that can, that can create some stress and tension, okay? So knowing what your team's cognitive score is, their Colby score, is the third part of the puzzle when you're building the winning team, okay? When you're building your engine room team of talent, as I call it. So... It depends. Classic answer, it depends. Um, Travis is a two in fact finder, and he is one of the best fits on my team, period. That's a difference of five, OK? Now, that, that can work because of two, two big factors. Number one, Travis and I are very strong affectively. Like, we're f we've been friends for a long time. I trust him. He tolerates me, right? <laughs> Big smile. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're supposed to say no to that. You know. No. 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 Okay. Okay. So, um, 
you know, so we have the strength of this relationship that he can be patient with me and I can be patient with him. Plus, just as individuals, um, Travis is a very strong communicator. Like, in his cognition, in his skills, he's a very strong communicator. And he can say to me, Tim, this needs to be a three-minute conversation or less. Do you think we can cover it in three minutes? And he's now he's using a cognitive skill to make up for the big difference in our conation. And the strength of our affect also helps us to overcome the big difference in our conation. So if you notice, when I said a difference of four or more, I didn't say there would be conflict. I said there's potential for conflict. And that is a difference, OK? So that's, that's one way to manage it, OK? The other way to manage those big cognitive differences is through bringing in other team members, right? So when you have other people on the team that can bridge the gap between any two people that are very different cognitively, that's kind of like the bridge that everybody can walk over. So in our team, we actually do have a bunch of high fact finders and then a couple low fact finders. Um, that happened because before I understood Colby, I was hiring people and lo and behold, I was hiring people just like me, as most entrepreneurs tend to do, because it's comfortable. We go, oh, that person's like me. Yeah, oh, I think it'd be a good fit. We really get along, and they seem to work the way that I do. This is going to be great, right? That's OK in the beginning. You can get away with that with one or two people. But when you have five people that are all the same, if everybody's high fact finder, and we're not aware of it because we've never done our Colby tests or something, we're going to have long ass meetings with tons of detail and information on like one topic. And the next nine topics will be orphans because they never get attended to, right? So having someone in the meeting who's like, um, <clears throat> it's been like 28 minutes of talking the same topic. Do you think we could just bottom line this thing? <laughs> Does wonders. Does wonders. Um, when somebody is in the middle on all scores, they're what's called a mediator, and they're very powerful to any team. So actually, Winnie is a, me a mediator, very strong. Shen actually has a lot of mediator as well. And Paul, you actually have a lot of mediator as well. Yeah. And uh, afterwards, talk to me about your implementer. Like after this is done, talk to me about your implementer and the business that you were thinking about starting. Because I've been wanting to talk to you about that for like six weeks now. OK? Um, so finding ways to bridge the differences through how you build the team is, is another strategy. Does that make sense, Brad? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So now we know what we're doing. Okay, we've got this product backlog of all the projects we want to tackle. You know, I want to build a website, I want to do an email follow-up sequence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I've gotten all these great strategies from different courses or seminars I've done or consultants I've worked with. How do I now pick where I'm going to begin? So when you get your sense of priorities, then you start in the engine room with assembling and arranging your team. Okay, and that could be anything from teaching my martial arts classes, okay, to helping build my website, to being an administrator, to a bookkeeper. Like it's all in. Okay. Some of your team will be full time, some will be part time, some will be one off. Okay. Like I like to think that my lawyer is a one off, <laughs> project by project person on my team rather than an ongoing weekly meeting, okay? And he is. <laughs> then from there, we know our product backlog. We know our team of talent, okay, that's going to take this awesome journey with us. And now we need to move into the next step. So if you follow the arrow clockwise, we get to the next big section, which is lead them, okay? And in lead them, we've got three ingredients. We've got vision, we've got resources, and oh so nasty and insidious definition of done. If I were to tell you, not just that, yeah, Travis is smiling because we've been through some of this together. Not just the 80-20, but like the 80-20 of the 80-20 of the 80-20. So the like 0.4% or whatever of issues, or I'm sorry, of causes that create like 99.8 or 6% of the problems that we go through on our team is inadequate definition of done. OK? So a very simple example would be if I said, you know, let's say this team right here is, is, is my engine room. I said, I would like you to draw me a sports car. In fact, let's do this. I'm going to actually pick these four right here just because you guys are the closest. OK, don't show each other. D so you got to keep it hidden, OK? So keep it hidden. This is not a team effort, and it's, this isn't school, so no more cheating. 
winning. Oh, 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 <laughs> what? No, I'm, I'm totally just kidding. You're like, what? No, I know you're an excellent student, A plus across the boards, and it was awesome. No, yeah. I, actually need to I actually need you to tell me, like, what, I what is it that I'm supposed to be doing? <laughs> you're making me uncomfortable. Okay, so without showing each other, draw me a sports car, please. A prize. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, there is a prize provided by Shanna. Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. You've, uh, oh. Right, I, geez, oh, I'm so sorry. I forgot we've got a professional artist here. I'm no, so, no, no, I'm no. so sorry, <laughs> I'm so sorry to, to give, I'm, I'm give, I know, and, and it's like, draw me to your standard a car in under 10 seconds. It's like, oh my goodness, right, okay. Okay, so you've got another, let's say, seven seconds, six, five, four, three, two, one. Okay. So one, so one by one, by one by one, I'd like you to come up. You're going to tell us the car and just give us a 30 set, not even like a 15 second show and tell. I know it's a little bit small, so it'd be tough for you to see, but it's like, you know, hey, if, you know, if, it, if it's like, hey, you know, my, my sports car is this kind of a car. It could be used for this kind of racing, that kind of thing. So Winnie, come on up. Yeah. I know, that's, that's two things in a row. It's two things in a row. <laughs> okay, so, so turn it around and show it to the audience and, and, <laughs> and, so and, and just tell us when it would be a good time to use this car, what kind of racing. This would be very good in the 1950s. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I tried to draw a little fin in the back because that's what like sports... A like yeah. a spoiler. Yeah. And I'm just not a really good drawer, but it can it can move because it has four wheels. <laughs> okay, okay. So we've we've kind of got like a, a box styling. Okay, we've got four wheels and it's got a spoiler. Okay. All right. So uh, everybody, congratulations, Winnie. Okay. Okay, Aaron. Do we dare bring yours up? Oh, it's really hard to see? Okay. 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 That, 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 yeah. I'll just, I'll verbally describe it. So, okay. So, Aaron, tell us about your car. Uh, wow, it's nice. It has, it's uh, aerodynamic. It's got a bit of a spoiler on the back. It has lights and a grill because it's taking lots of air. Yeah. And whatever that, that does in a car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it. It's kind of it's low. It's aerodynamic. And it, it almost has a DeLorean Back to the Future kind of vibe. It's it's it's, it's, <laughs> it's it's show. Well, yeah, me too. So it's shorter and it's also it's it doesn't have a, a fixed. Uh, the, it's like just it's low profile, a little bit more Lamborghini low and sleek. Okay, thank you very much, Aaron. Thank you very much. Okay, Cat. Cat's gonna come on up. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, just come stand right here, and hopefully Vic can, can zoom in. Anybody can see this. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, so show it, show it to show it to Vic here. There we go. And and and, and tell us tell us about it. So okay. it's a Porsche with a Fender Ooh. double stripe. It's amazing for street racing. Um, under the speed limit, right? Please. P oh. <laughs> That's a suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> Not a requirement. Okay. Uh, okay. Can can you can I see it again? Okay. So it's got two stripes. It's a Porsche, it's got round headlights, a low profile, also has a spoiler, and um, looks very aerodynamic. Okay, thank you, Kat. Okay. Okay, Travis, come on up. All right. All right. Okay, so, sh so show this to the, the audience. This is my car. Yeah. Okay. So this is, a, uh, this is a Roadster, my take on an old style Roadster, probably like 1950s, 60s, I don't know. Um, my stepdad has one of these, it's pretty sweet. Um, you'd probably use this at like drag racing, you know, or out mm. on the highway when it's actually nice outside. Okay. Um, so it's, it's not like it's not like a rally car, race car, no, where you're like through the like mud. That. and no, this is okay. a, this is power. This is lots of power. So, so we've got uh, no spoiler. It's um, two seats side by side. It's got um, an, a rear end mounted engine, mm -hmm. and it's convertible. Arf, arf, arf. Yeah, there we go. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> 
So if a client paid me $10,000 to produce a website and they said, I want a car, and we got these four versions, how frustrated do you think the client would be if they got that? Because what, 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 they, didn't, what they didn't tell you and what you didn't ask them is, tell me more about the car. Clarify the definition of done. What is like the acceptance criteria that you need to see to sign off on this? So, yeah, what you guys didn't know is what I was actually looking for was an indie race car where it's single seater, right? Not even street legal, no headlights, extremely low profile, wing on the back, wing on the front, right? Wouldn't that have been helpful? Wouldn't that have helped our engine room to produce the right product? The clearer that your definition of done is to your team, the more that you get to step out of the engine room and just let them roll, okay? Now, in the very beginning of a project, you might be doing something that you've never done before, right? You might be saying, I don't really know what all the specifications are for this website. Here's the broad strokes, though. And you might, you might be doing something so broad that you don't even know what the broad strokes are, and that's when you do something called user stories, right? So, like I said to the team here, I said, you know what, you guys? I don't know how to, you know, I don't know what the answer is, but everybody who comes through the door needs to be quote unquote processed or registered and paid in under five minutes. So that's one of my acceptance criteria, okay? I want the front desk to have a good experience too, you know, where it's smooth and enjoyable. They can focus on having fun with people on the way in rather than being frustrated and scrambling, okay? And as me, the speaker, I don't want to have to come in and manage all these fires going off. I need to be able to just literally stroll in and play my role and just my role. So those are like kind of user stories. User stories, if you want to write this down, writer downer, is as an X, I want to Y so that I can Z for my American friends. <laughs> Z. Okay? I want to X. Or I'm sorry, as an X, I want to Y so that I can Z. Okay? So as the speaker, I want to simply walk in, get mic'd up, and speak so that I can focus my energy and time and talent on leading the group rather than putting out all these fires and running around like a chicken with my head cut off. Okay? As an attendee, I would like to be checked in in under five minutes smoothly so that I can really focus on networking and being relaxed and enjoying my experience. Um, another user story that I put into the team was, as an attendee, I want to put in my contact information only once so that I don't get frustrated repeating the same work. I don't want to have to put all my information into a payment system to cr process my credit card and then a second time into the registration system when I register, okay? So you can have multiple user stories, there can be multiple users, and this is for those situations when you really don't even know, you have no, like, no sense of maybe what some of the details are. I'll get to you in one sec, Kalen. Zooming more in though, the other extreme is like when you really know what you want, maybe you've done it before, but maybe not quite exactly this way, you can get right down to like, I want a five page website I want the front page to have the logo in the top right corner. I want the 1-800 number for us just below that. I want four items in the nav bar. I want an opt-in form above the fold. I want a picture of my target market experiencing the end benefit. Below that, I want a bar with logos of places that I've appeared. Below that, I want testimonials. Like, that's extremely specific. No need for user stories there. Like, you don't need to sit there and write like, as a visitor to the website, I want to be able to look to the right top right hand corner and locate the phone number for this fine company so that I can easily call them with any of my queries to make my day happier. Okay? It's ridiculous. It's <laughs> over managing, it's way over managing the situation. Okay? So in your business, there's some things that are going to be very high level and undefined. Consider using user stories. 
And as you start to get definition and clarity, maybe because you've done it a few times before, or maybe because you're repeating it all together, or maybe because you just really, really, really know what you want, then ditch the user stories altogether and just get down into like basically the checklist of what I want. Okay. I know that when I'm working with Travis on something, he's like so happy when I can get into that really granular specific place. And at the same time, sometimes we can't start there. We just don't maybe know what exactly we want. There's a great ex um, expression that oftentimes a customer or a client, and sometimes you are your own customer, right? If you're developing in-house marketing or in-house work, oftentimes a customer doesn't know what they want until they see what they don't want, okay? That's worth remembering maybe even writing down, is oftentimes customers don't know, what, uh, uh, don't know what they want until they see what they don't want. Did I say that right? Uh, oftentimes people don't know what they want until they see what they don't want. Okay? So an expression that we've developed on our team, I started saying it probably, I don't know, a few months ago, was we want to get to know as soon as possible. We want to get to know as soon as possible with our clients. Because if the client's like, oh yeah, looks good, looks good, looks good, looks good, looks good. I don't know if it actually looks good or if they're not paying attention and they're just brushing it off. If someone says no to me, oh no, actually I don't like that, can you please make a different color? I know they're paying attention. And now I know we're in this creative negotiation to, to achieve what it is that they want. Okay? So whether it's you to your own team or you to outside clients, getting to know as soon as possible whatever it is you're doing. Okay? If you're negotiating to raise money from them, you want to get no from them as soon as possible so that you can adjust course as early as possible. Okay? If you are creating a, some kind of a, a financial plan for them, then you want to get a no from them as soon as possible so they can help you find that right fit. Okay? So looking at lead them, I'm just going to do a quick time check here. Looking at lead them, we've got definition of done. And I've, I've really invested a lot of time into that because it is such a huge, hugely underappreciated and a <laughs> huge make it or break it factor, okay? Above that is resources, okay? Resources is time, energy, money, and maybe even talent, okay? So your engine room has to have the talent on it to get the job done that you're asking them to get done. If you ask somebody to produce, you know, if you ask your engine room to produce business cards for you, but you don't put a graphic designer on the team, we've got a problem, okay? Even if it's just a part-time graphic designer or a one-off graphic designer. Resources. So we came up, we came across this actually fairly recently, is I said to the team in, in one of our retrospectives, which um, if you know Scrum, you'd understand that. Um, I said to them, you know what, you guys, I don't know what this looks like, but here's a user story. As Tim, you know, the spokesperson and owner of the company, I just want to be involved less so that I can focus on the high value stuff that I seem to be really good at and maybe I'm in a unique position to do, like fly to San Francisco, shake hands, kiss babies, fly to, you know, Austin, shake hands, kiss babies, then go to a wedding, you know, where there's also some people I might meet and then go to Vancouver and like, I need to just focus on that, you know, because that's where I want to be in the business. I want to spend just less and less and less time actually producing work, as funny as that sounds, okay? Less, less time producing engine room work. And so I said, what, what are we going to do about that? Like, guys, you tell me. Like, you're on the front lines. And they said, well, okay, one thing that we oftentimes have to ask you for help on is budget. Hey, Tim, you know, we're doing this website and we need to buy five stock photos and every time we have to buy a photo for 25 bucks we find ourselves stopping and asking you for you to approve it could you just give us a budget and say you're welcome to spend up to 200 dollars on this website you know on stock images and have at it so that again is setting up your team with the resources and again they don't have to ask you okay all the time for everything okay so vision is also part of lead them People just want to know, what are they a part of? <laughs> Where are we going? What are we doing? You know, and maybe it seems ridiculous to write down things like, we're in XYZ industry because it seems self-evident. But as you clarify your vision, why you're doing it, what the direction is, who your target market is, it helps your team to do a wide range of things, including look out for you. As they're in their day-to-day -day and they are doing work maybe for you or maybe for someone else if they're a part-timer, 
they can keep their eye out for what does a good customer look like? What is a cool blog post that might have a resource that might be interesting? I know my team forwards me stuff all the time. They say, oh, hey, you know, I was looking through Inc. Magazine. I, I stumbled across this. That sounds like you know, they're looking for people who have expertise with hiring virtual teams. You know, may, you know, maybe that's something that we can throw your name in the hat for to see if this magazine would want to publish you. So that, those kinds of things. So now that we are leading our team, we've given them vision, we've given them resources, and we've provided for them a clear definition of done, now the engine room really kicks into action. Okay? And th the engine room is going to use two main strategies. <coughs> One is going to be Scrum and the other is going to be Systems. So Scrum is anytime you're doing something new that you haven't done before. Okay, when we're going off in the wild blue yonder, building a website that's never been done before, or starting up a whole new division of a company, or hiring 20 new people, okay, that is a great spot for Scrum. Systems is where we capture the wisdom of what we learn along the way on how to do things, um, maybe checklists, guidelines, so that we don't have to learn the same lesson over and over and over again. Okay? So, and I specifically put systems below Scrum because the further you go down the road into your business and the more expertise and the more like team wisdom that you generate, the deeper the foundation gets. And to me, that's kind of the role of systems, right? Like, I, why is it that a 19-year-old can roll into work at McDonald's, have one week of training, and be a part of a team that produces billions of dollars of revenue just like that, okay? It's because McDonald's spent a lot of time in the unknown learning and constantly refining to strengthen their systems, okay? To do the things that are repeated, flipping burgers, processing payments, pouring milkshakes, okay? So we've, got, we've now kicked off the team. The team's out there. They're using a mix of scrum and systems to get things done. And then we have to have a point where we actually review the results. And that's the third big box, kind of in the bottom left corner. And when we're reviewing results down here, there's really two things that we're doing. One is we want to learn. We want to refine the direction of our product and of our company with market feedback. So we want to take a look at how are people responding. You know, maybe what we thought we needed to build is actually off by a few degrees, or maybe a lot of degrees, and we need to turn you know, and pivot and start building something different or something complementary. Offer a new program, offer a different kind of investment, whatever it is that you're doing. Then from there, we also need to refine our process with our t uh, of team collaboration. So for example, when, so, you know, when my team says to me, Tim, we find ourselves stopping all the time to ask you for budget approvals, that's us refining our process. And me saying, OK, cool. Now I know I'll approve $200 per website, no questions asked. I trust you guys. You have my credit card. Go. right? Or something like, hey, Tim, we always have to stop and ask you for help on login information. What can we do about that? Right? We start looking into it. We realize you can use a service called LastPass, where I can give people my password without them actually seeing it. It's a great service. Okay? So that's what I mean by improving our team process. How do we work together? How can we get faster, stronger, smoother, more profitable? And we also want to do this other part, which is capture wisdom. Okay? And that's creating guidelines, templates, checklists, step by step. So an example of that would be, hey, our graphic design projects always seem to work out the best when we use a design brief in the start, which is a checklist of different questions that the graphic designer will ask me or ask the client to get clear on what exactly success looks like. So that's a, you know, a guideline, is we're going to use this template, and we're going to use it every time we do a graphic design project. So then all of that, as you can see, feeds back into Scrum and systems so that the team is bigger, faster, stronger. And then it cycles around. And after you've looked at your results, you as the business owner, you need to reevaluate the team. You know, do we have the right people in the team? Same questions. Do we have the, the right skills? How is the energy of the team? Is the Colby score getting in the way? Or is it helping us? Right? And maybe we need to reassign certain people as the business grows. Like Sarah used to do uploading blog posts for me and podcast episodes and a lot of those kinds of tasks. And over time, we've discovered that her cognitive, cognitive, and affective makeup, plus what I need from her as a business owner has changed. And so now she doesn't do any of that. And now she handles my email inbox and does scheduling and some of our email marketing work. Right? So her role has evolved even just in the last two years that she's worked for me. Okay? And that comes from just keeping your eye on the ball. 
So if the engine room team is in the middle, you as the business owner are on the outside. You're running laps around the outside. Okay? You are not in the engine room. Okay? So now, as with most things in life, it's, it's never a super clean, tidy, here today, change tomorrow transition from stage one to stage two or from stage two to stage three. Okay, it's not like you just wake up one day and you've got this team and you're outside of the engine. Like it's a process, okay? It's a process over time. And it starts with hiring your first person, then your second person, and then maybe you start introducing some project management methods and whatnot, okay? So any questions on that? Or there's a lot of questions? Okay, Aaron. Someone like me who's an artist, I never want to be outside. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so Tim, I get it that you want to run a conglomerate. <laughs> you have uh, Richard Branson Envy, where you're not working in any of the businesses. What do I do if I want to be in my business? Because Erin's a fabulous artist, right? And she wants to continue doing the art. So then I would say, pick the, you know, pick the extremely specific parts of the business you do want to do and make that a part of the engine room that you take care of and jealously guard that two ways. Nobody else comes in and you don't go out, right? You are in that specific area and you know what? Sarah made a few mistakes with scheduling. Okay, that's still hers. I'm not gonna come, I'm not gonna jump the fence and go start doing that, okay? Sometimes like with you know, friends or athletes or children, they just need to make their mistakes, okay? And you want to be there to support them with time, energy, money, skills, coaching, mentorship, whatever, to help them, you know, to learn the lesson they need to, to get better. There was a guy working at, at Microsoft that made some cataclysmic error that cost Microsoft like $5 million or something like that. Did, do you know the story? Okay. And so then somebody said to Bill Gates, like, you know, so you're going to fire him now or what? And he said, he said, I just spent $5 million training this guy. <laughs> You think I'm going to fire him? No way, right? Okay. Now, obviously, there's situations where you are going to need to you know, help people find a different opportunity, obviously. But think about it. You are developing an asset. Okay? I, I, I don't agree with experts and speakers and leaders and books or whatever that, that talk about the team being some faraway people at arm's length that are just kind of like cogs in a machine. Like, you know, I mean, my people geographically are far from me for the most part. Aside from Travis, like everybody's in the United States or Italy. So they're geographically far. But we are, I'm investing in them and they're investing in me for the long term. And that's how you have the machine self-strengthening and getting better every single week and month that goes by. That's the game that I want to play because I want to build enduring assets. I don't want just some little trick that's going to work for five minutes until the ball moves and then we're screwed again. Okay? Brad? Oh, phenomenal. I love that. So I'll say it again just so everybody hears that. Brad, awesome analogy, says, you know, the coach doesn't jump on the field and take the ball out of the quarterback's hands if a mistake happens or, or whatnot. The coach stays on the sidelines and coaches. That's, I might steal that. <laughs> I might end up in a book that I write about. As Brad Molyneux said. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, and Aaron, I would, I, would even, I would even, you know, make this parallel. Maybe it's a slightly different way to look at it. You know, in my own crazy way, building the businesses and consulting and, you know, my goal of having multiple businesses that all bring me revenue, almost like a, a real estate portfolio, that's my art, you know? And so for me, I get to be in my art when I'm not in the engine room, when I'm running around the, the perimeter. So maybe think of that, you know, maybe think of the engine room as like the business machine that supports everything that you need it to do for you. And so Kalen, Kalen, just so everybody heard that, said, you know, in his uh, self-defense, Jim, there are certain things that he doesn't want to have coaches teach either, right? I, so, so to that, I would say, what is the 80-20 of programs that you teach? What is the 80-20 of art that you do? One of my clients down in Calgary, there's a huge 80-20.
he absolutely loves, 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 he, he teaches youth athletes. He trains them to you know, make it to the NCAA and WHL and NHL and, all, and, and like high level sports. There's like a few courses that he just loves teaching more than all the others combined. And you know what, they also make him, it's like 6x the money every time he does it. So you betcha he wants to be doing that. It's his passion, it's what he's focused on. So I, would, I don't think I'd ever ask him to not do it. You know what I mean? Because again, like you two, that's, that's why he is there. <laughs> and he has a business supporting that, right? I mean, it's one of the reasons he's there, but one of the main reasons. Peter. Well, I was thinking of the innovation of creativity. Like in your business, you're looking for business opportunities worldwide, I expect now. Is some of that coming out of your team now? Do they know what you're looking for and they're mm. uh, acting as a sort of a monitor, watch yourself sort of thing? So the question was, does in my engine room, do I have team members who are watching for business opportunities, maybe for me to acquire businesses? That's kind of what you're saying. So I'm not at that stage yet, but I, I think one day I will be at a point, presuming that I want to continue down that path, I, I think I'll be at a spot where, yes, I'll have like um, researchers, right? Or other people playing that kind of role, maybe evaluating deals. Maybe, maybe not, I'm not sure, you know? I haven't played that role enough to know what I want to do with it. So I think that it's about um, just, you know, being in the spirit of discovery kind of that whole way through and see where do I fit into my own business, right? I'm, I'm thinking about things like university professors, they use tipping services. Mm. So they got commercial companies out there just reading about your, what you do and reading and reading and reading. When they see it, they click it and they feed yep. it to you. That That's great. Thing. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I love that. And I'm sure Warren Buffett has people sending him deals and, and right? So, yeah. And, and I think it's really, you know, as those of you who have come with the weekend course, it's about climbing that 80-20 curve, right? So if you line up all the tasks in your business, you sign them all a dollar per hour value, it, systematically getting yourself out of the 10, 15, 20 dollar an hour type work and spending more and more time in the 50 dollar an hour work and up. And so right now, the next person I'm gonna hire is actually a salesperson. That's the next person I'm looking to hire. And that's definitely much further up because I've spent a lot of time working out all of the, the lower end tasks. We've taken care of that now, and now we just keep moving up. So now if I have an engine room producing the work, and I have a salesperson producing sales, and I stick them together, that is real exciting to me. That is real. And that gets back to that $10,000 question I've taught you guys before. What would you have to change in your business to increase, to, to maintain or increase revenue while working only one hour a day? Right? That's, I paid $10,000 to, <laughs> to learn that question from Richard Kosh in Chicago. And my answer was, I need a copywriter, I need a marketing analyst, and I need a salesperson. So the next thing I'm doing is finding a salesperson. Is I've got, sorry? Is there a piece of lesson you could say? The $10,000 question? Yeah. Okay, so what would I have to change in my business so that I could maintain or increase revenue while working only one hour a day? And maybe you never would work one hour a day, but if you answer that question, it puts you in a position to get the team around you that you could if you needed to, needed or wanted to. Because Richard works only one hour a day. He does. Okay. Any questions before we move on? <coughs> so to wrap up, there's um, two things. Um, I am, so, 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 if I, so if we say nothing else, did you guys get value out of today? Yeah. Does everybody feel like they're a little further along their path because they invested the last hour here today? Yes. Yes. Okay. That's really important to me. You know, money will come and go. Twenty bucks or forty bucks or whatever is you know money, but like your time and energy does not replenish, right? So, and I never want to be the guy who stands up here and tells you in excess what to do and then doesn't tell you how to do it. Oh, but kidding, there's a course, right? Okay. So I hope that you felt there's tremendous value here in of itself. Now I am teaching a course, which you know about. Um, if you'd like to spend a weekend with me diving into exactly how to build your engine room in greater detail, face to face, I'll take you through a handful of exercises to literally know what knobs to turn in your business next you know, who to hire, what to do, what procedures maybe to write out, what projects to attack next. I encourage you to come out. It's in less than one month now, okay? It's in like 29 days is the next rendition. Um, it's called the Business Breakthrough Experience. It's happening here at the Hilton in a different room. Um, tickets are $1,000 for the first person. 
it's $14.94 if you want to bring a friend. So two tickets for $14.94. Um, <laughs> Jimmy Jays, uh, who many of us know, said that when he came, it was better than a two-week vacation because when he came back, he didn't have two weeks of backlog <laughs> to fight with. And he's able to get you know, just a lot more freedom in his business. We're going to be talking about the, you know, the nuts and bolts of Scrum for Business. I will help you find more $100 an hour and up type tasks in your business so that you can justify in your mind hiring a team around you um, at $15 and $20 an hour. I'm going to help you get those ideas that have been in your mind for months, weeks, maybe even years. Jimmy said he's had five years of, of projects he's wanted to do, but he's just been in such a log jam to actually put them into motion. And I'll help you figure out, you know, what those projects are, get them down, and what you need to do first so that you can unstuck the log jam. We always talk about working on your business, not in your business. Who's ever heard that maxim before? <laughs> Every one of us. What does that actually mean? You know what I mean? So you'll see exactly what to do. Um, I will be there personally. I will be with you all weekend. Any questions you have on any of the exercises, if you want me to walk you know, arm in arm with you to complete an exercise, it's very interactive. Um, and uh, I'm also backed you know, by not only the experience, but for those of you that really care about credentials, I'm worldwide Scrum certified, I'm worldwide Colby certified, and I've just been doing it. So I'm happy to help you guys follow, follow in some of the footsteps that I've, I've walked um, over the last handful of years. And to real, really top it off, um, um, I'm going to tell you about the guarantee. I'm going to ask Shanna to talk for two minutes about her experience um, of working with me. And um, then we'll have the room for maybe another half hour for networking if you feel like sticking around. Obviously, if you've got to go, I understand. So the guarantee on the Business Breakthrough Experience is what's called the Better Than Hawaii Guarantee. Okay. So if you implement what I teach you during the Business Breakthrough Experience, and believe me, you're not just getting theory. You're actually going to walk out with uh, Aaron and Paul. Have bought, you, know, you guys walked out with like a, sil like a paper rolled up under your arm of what you were going to do for the next two weeks. Like it does not get any more specific, granular, and actionable than that. Okay. You to pay a grand just for the piece of paper? Yeah. <laughs> I'm writing that testimonial down now. <laughs> I love it. So if you implement what you teach, I guarantee you will make and or save $5,000 by virtue of coming to the course, which is the price of a damn fine trip for two to Hawaii. So that's my better than Hawaii guarantee. Plus, you won't be coming back to two weeks of fires to put out <laughs> from being away for a while. Shanna, would you be so kind as to come up and talk about just your experience? And we're going to, I'm going to somehow give you this. Sounds awkward. Yeah, maybe come on this side of me. There we go. We'll, we'll stand nice and close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, good. Hmm. Okay, <laughs> wait. That's just for the cameras, right? Yeah. Yeah, for, for, yeah, yeah, for our recording. Hi, everyone. My name's Shannon Niemar. My fiance, Ash, and I run a business called Edmonton Updowns. I've been investing in real estate for the last 10 years. And so our, in our business, we provide opportunities for people to invest their money with us in real estate. So one of the main parts of our business is raising capital. And then the other parts are uh, acquiring properties, renovating them, and then renting them out and all the management that goes along with that. So uh, my personal goal is to get enough rental properties to get out of the rat race and have my bills paid so that I can indeed sit on a beach if I want to. <laughs> and so I had been going through this process for a number of years. It had been about eight years, and I was getting really frustrated at the rate that I was acquiring properties. I thought by then I should have been done already. I was working way too hard and not making enough progress. Um, so Ash and I set a goal to buy 20 new properties in the next year, and we set about doing that. And at that time, it was very fortunate that we met Tim, and I noticed that I, I, my personal mentality was always just work harder. It was, you know, I had all these things to take care of and I never stopped to think about it. I just thought, you know, just if I just focus, if I just a little more dedicated, if I just, you know, get, get over this hurdle of what needs to be done right now, then, then, you know, then I'll be okay again. But with adding more and more to your business, there's no way that you're ever going to have time to do it all yourself. So Tim really got me into the systems mindset 
Um, I started with freeing up some of my own personal time. I hired house cleaners. I started using a courier service to run errands. Um, simple things like I, stopped, I started just saying no when people said, can you drive across the city and sign this document for us? Uh, no, how about you fax it to me? So I ended up saving a tremendous amount of time just with that mindset. Eventually my business grew and that time got taken up by the business again. And more and more I'm trying to develop systems to have other people do the administrative, you know, less important parts, the, the bottom 20% of my business and so that I can spend my time growing the business, finding investors, building systems. Um, I just hired my first VA a couple weeks ago. Which is, it's, uh, it's been pretty time consuming getting them set up with all the work, but every time I sort of give a, a task that I really didn't like doing but had to do, it's a, you know, it's a nice little celebration. Um, I just wanted to say a little bit about working with Tim and how much I've really, really appreciated it. Um, I can tell Tim that, or I can tell that Tim really cares about me and my business and my mm -hmm. success. Um, in addition to the guidance that he's given me on overall concepts and framework, he's he's done exactly what I wanted, I want and need to do. So he's able to answer my incredibly specific questions step by step how to do things, and it saved me a lot of time in figuring out how to do them on my own preventing problems that he's already lived through and sorted out. Um, it's just been really, really amazing. And I'm, I'm so fortunate that I met you. Mm. So thanks very much. I want to give you a hug now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes. you can have this one. I'll, I'll be like a puppy behind you on the leash. It's like <laughs> <laughs> OK. Any questions on anything that we've covered today? Or should we just wrap it up and get to chatting? We're all good? Okay. If you'd like to come, profitfactory.ca, not .com, but .ca, is the URL with the business breakthrough experience. We have only 20 spots, uh, 20 tickets going out. I think we've sold a few. I'm, I'm not sure of the exact number. And uh, if you have any questions about this or anything else, I'll be here, like I said, for all the next kind of 20, 30, 45 minutes, something like that, ready to just chat. So thank you for your time, energy, and everything today. I'm always honored when I see everybody here. And our next event is... Um, on meetup.com. I always forget to pull this up. It's uh, June V, June, because now is May. Uh, June V, so June the 4th is our next lunch, like this. The business breakthrough experience is June 13, 14. And then I think it'll be July the 2nd will be the next event after that. And then I think it'll be Thursday, August 6th, the next lunch after that. So. Uh, business breakthrough experience I will not do for at least another three months afterwards. So if, you, if you're not a part of this one, it'll be at least three months, maybe six months before we do it again. Yeah, so in thi so this is, so every time I do the course, it gets like, you know, better and better and better. And so we're not going to go super, super deep into the exact, like the deepest level that I know about systems. Um, it, it's going to touch on systems. I would. Yeah. Yeah. I would recommend this course first. Yeah, this course first because you got to get things sorted out. Yeah, Paul agrees. Yeah, you got to get things sorted out. The log jam unstuck, and you know, get the engine room started. You know, and then after that, as you're learning along the way, you can capture wisdom and get more deeply into systems. Then, so I would start here for sure. Thank you, everybody, and we'll see you next month.